Okay, welcome to what should be our last online lesson. And this one's on sort of a new topic on rate of change, tangents, secants. This is the first kind of introduction to calculus lesson. So if you take calculus with me next semester, then this is kind of where calculus starts. So we're going to be talking about rate of change a lot in the, uh, this lesson. So the only time you've really heard about rate of change probably is with linear functions. And the rate of change of a, of a linear function or a line is called the slope of the line. And slope is equal to rise of a run. So when we talk about a line and the rise of a run for the line, notice that that doesn't change. That ratio remains the same or is constant. So linear functions are actually the only functions who have a constant rate of change, a rate of change that doesn't change. And so we call that slope. But a curve isn't like that. So if you imagine really any curve, if you went to try to calculate the rate of change of a curve, then your rate of change would depend on the points that you selected. It would change, so to speak. It wouldn't be constant. So we actually don't usually use the word slope of a curve. It's not really a term that we use. Instead, we just talk about the rate of change, or what will later be called, if you take calculus, will be called the derivative. We're not going to worry about that this year, though. So we need to talk about two important lines on a curve, a secant and a tangent. And you might be somewhat familiar with those terms. A secant is a line that touches a curve at two or more points. And you see the secant that's been drawn here. It joins two points here. It, that actually represents the average rate of change. So if I wanted to, I could look at the rise and the run between these two points on the secant line, and that would give me the average rate of change from this point to this point. If I change the secant line so it was only half as long, so maybe the point ended here, well then I would get a different rate of change. Okay, But this one from here to here gives me the average rate of change. Um, a tangent is a, a line that... This says touches the graph at exactly one point. We should probably clarify it touches the graph without crossing it at a point. It is possible to have tangent lines. For example, if you draw a tangent line here, a tangent line here would actually touch the graph and it, it, uh, intersect the graph in another spot as well. And that's fine. It's still a tangent line to this point right here. Tangent lines represent instantaneous rate of change. Okay. Or the rate of change at that specific instant. In a minute, we'll use uh, a roller coaster example to kind of explain that. Secant, interestingly enough, um, comes from the Latin word for cutting something. So this cuts the curve. And tangent comes from the Latin word for touch. So it touches the curve. Okay, so here we have a graph that I've made up that I'm going to call um, I'm going to say that a model is a roller coaster with the height on the y-axis and the time in seconds. Let's not really worry about how realistic that is. I just I thought it, I think a roller coaster is a good example here. So the question is, what do the slopes of tangents tell you about the shape of the roller coaster? So we might imagine there are there's no end to the number of tangent lines we could draw here. There's one right there. Um, I actually have a little demo in Desmos all open now. So this is the same curve just in Desmos, and I've got a tangent line that I'll move here, and you can see it. I almost like to think of um, the red, like imagine you're in a car driving, the tangent line would be where your headlights would be. And this represents, in a roller coaster, this would represent, if we're talking about height versus time, this is your instantaneous speed. Okay, If you were to look at the slope of this red line, and you were to draw the rise and the run here, You'd be talking about a drop in height versus a change in time. So change in height over change in time would be like meters per second. So it's actually your instantaneous rate of change or instantaneous speed on the roller coaster. Now I should clarify, it's your it's your speed downward, okay? It's the rate of change go, as you go up or down, okay? So notice that in this part of the roller coaster, the tangent lines are have a negative slope because your speed is negative you're going towards the ground for one instant here if I can get it in the right spot you actually do have a rate of change of zero and then your rate of change becomes positive because your speed is increasing because you're going up now I should call it velocity actually not speed it's your um, vertical velocity okay so they um, 
The slopes of the tangent lines tell us the instantaneous velocity in meters per second, velocity down. How about the slope of secants? Well, if I were to take a secant perhaps, and say join maybe these two points right here, well, that's going to give me the average velocity. So in this case, over this time interval, it's like you're calculating on average how, how fast did you go or how much did you drop, which is sort of silly because it ignores this little part right here. So on average, it's like if you were to calculate your height here and your height here and divide that by the time, it gives you how much you dropped per second on average without considering this little dip here, which actually, you know, is sort of misleading, but, but that's what that, this is what it represents. And in general, um, the units for tangent line slopes and secant line slopes will always be the same. Okay, you're still calculating a rise and a run, in this case, always in meters per second. In general, um, secants always give you the average rate of change, and slopes of tangents always give you the instantaneous rate of change. In this example, we've got David, and David is draining water from a hot tub, a hot tub that holds 1,600 liters of water. Now in this example, David is draining water from the hot tub, and he's interested in knowing about the rate of change of the volume of the hot tub as the water drains out. Now we in this example, we have an equation here, V of T is 1 ninth, 120 minus T squared. So it's just a quadratic function, and it's written in factored form like this. It actually makes it easier to work with for many of the calculations here. So the first thing we look at is the graph here. So this is the graph of this situation. Okay, you can see that it's 1600 liters when t equals zero, and then finally the hot tub hits a volume of zero at uh, after 120 minutes. So it takes two hours to drain. The first question here is, find the slope of the secant from t equals 60 to t equals 120. So I've drawn that secant line in now for you, starting at 60 and ending at 120. Notice here the secant is above the curve. Secant lines are sometimes above curve, sometimes they're below. It actually has to do with the concavity of the curve. When it's a smiley face like this, concave up, the secant will always be above, but you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so we calculate that slope. We're basically saying, I mean, we know these points here, and we're going to figure them out. Okay, so secant is, slope of the secant is equal to rise of a run, which is the change in y over the change in x, or y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Now, the notation here is going to be kind of important that we're going to use. I'm not just going to plug those points into this formula right away. Now, you might be asking, well, why not? I mean, the first point's 60, I believe it's 400, and the second one's 120, 0. You could just plug those in for x1, y1, x2, y2, and away you go. But first, I'm actually going to use this notation here. First of all, we're not talking about x and y here. We're talking about v and t. So change in v over change in t this point right here um, is technically, you could say it's one, rather than saying it's 120, zero, you could say it's 120 and V of 120. Now, when you plug 120 into the equation, you're gonna get zero, of course, but notation's important in this lesson, so I'm writing it like that. And then this point here, same idea, is 60 and V of 60. Now, if you put 60 into the equation, you will get 400, I believe. But this no, I need you to understand that notation too, okay? All right, so then we figure out V of 120, we get zero. We figure out V of 60, we get 400. Of course, 120 minus 60 is 60. And that gives us a slope of about negative 6.67 liters per minute. So we can then conclude that the average rate of change in volume of the water is negative 6.6 liters per minute from minute 60 to 120. Now let's say that David is really interested in knowing how fast the water is draining from the hot tub. Now obviously that changes. You can tell by either imagining slopes of tangents or just looking at the curve of the graph and you can realize that the hot tub drains faster at the beginning and slower at the end. Might have something to do with the water pressure, I'm not sure. So suppose, so David, Suppose he's really interested in knowing how fast is the hot tub draining exactly at 60 minutes. 
One way that you could calculate how fast the hot tub is draining at 60 minutes is to record the volume of water left in the hot tub, wait an hour, record the volume of hot tub, sorry, record the volume of water in the hot tub after that hour, and compare. Of course, after an hour, there's no water left. And you get this answer right here, which isn't a very good estimate. Okay, that's an average rate of change. It doesn't tell you how fast the water is draining exactly at minute 60. And let's suppose that David, that's really what he wants to know. So that's the question. So if David wants a better estimate for the instantaneous rate of change of volume in the hot tub at minute 60, a better idea would be he would record the volume at minute 60 and then start a stopwatch and after one minute record the volume again to find out how much water drained in that single minute. So again, we're still finding the slope of a secant, but instead of minute 120, we dropped it down to minute 61. So we have V of 61 minus V of 60 and 61 minus 60 for our, our run. You could draw that on the graph if you want, if that helps you see it. Okay, V of 61, if you plug 61 into the equation, that should be what you get. I'm not showing that work, okay? It's, it's just plug it, you know, you just plug it in. And this time we get a much different answer, negative 13.2222 liters per minute. Now I'm keeping a lot of decimals in these calculations and you'll kind of see why later. I mean, so that's his, his next es estimate. And that, that's probably a pretty good estimate, to be honest, like in real life, that would likely be good enough for you. But of course, in math, we want to be as precise as possible. I mean, this is a, um, we would like to know the exact value if we, if we could find it. So an even better idea would be to shorten up that time frame. And instead, find the slope of the secant. Why wait a minute? Okay, I mean, the water is draining slower and slower. So technically, I mean, go back to the graph here. Technically, at minute 61, the water is draining slower than it was at minute 60. So why not just wait half a minute or 30 seconds? Well, we can do that calculation too. We just look like that. Okay, now our Y2 value becomes 60.5 and our X2 is just 60.5. Plugging that into the equation, notice that these numbers here are getting closer and closer to 400, okay? So here's about a little less than seven liters has drained in 30 seconds. So we get 13.27778. Well, you can probably guess what I'm gonna do next. Why not wait 0.1 of a minute or six seconds and record the volume and see how much is drained. In this case, starting to get even closer to 400, so less than two liters of water drained in that 0.1 of a minute, which gives you a rate of change of 13.32222 liters per minute. And now you can see why I'm holding all those decimals there, because these numbers are starting, they're not changing a whole lot, okay? We can see that, you know, well, 13.2 is a pretty good estimate, 13.27778 is even better, and 13.3222 is a little bit better, Now you can probably guess what I'm going to do next here. Um, why wait 0.1 of a second when you can wait 0 0.01 of a second and calculate the volume at that point? It's going to be very close to 400. So see, I've got, you know, not even 0.15 of a liter has drained at that point in the 0 0.01 minutes, but I get an even more accurate answer for the rate of change, negative 13.332222 liters per minute. And that's our average rate of change there. Of course, we could keep going. There's no reason we need to stop at 60.01. We can get as close as we want to 60. Notice that we can't actually put V of 60 in here because we'd have 400 minus 400 over zero. We'd actually have zero over zero, which is definitely an undefined value, but we can put we can select our other point, we can put it as close as we want on that graph. So if I back up to that graph, okay, this is a poor estimate for the instantaneous rate of change, but I get better and better as I get closer and closer. Okay, so notice our solutions are getting closer and closer to the instantaneous rate of change at t equals 60. So we started with 6.67, negative 13.222, 
and so on, each time getting what is a better estimate for exactly how much water is draining per minute exactly at that 60 minutes. Now we also could have looked at the other side. So for example, in all these cases, in order for David to estimate the rate of change of the hot tub draining, he looked a little past. He started his stopwatch at 60 minutes and recorded the new volume after a short interval of time. He could have instead done something like started the stopwatch at 59 minutes and then recorded the volume at 60. Let's just do one of those. We'll just do 59.99, which is kind of the opposite of this calculation here. And if we do that, okay, of course we get something a little over 400 liters, but we now have a negative run instead, and we get negative 13.444 liters per minute. So that is the our estimate for the rate of change using the average. So we're this is technically not the instantaneous rate of change. This is the average rate of change from minute 59.9, sorry, 59.99, that should say, to 60, which is going to be very close to the instantaneous rate of change at 60, because how much difference in the rate of change could have occurred in such a small amount of time? Not much. In fact, we can go a bit further here and say that, look, the real instantaneous rate of change is going to be between negative 13.33222 and negative 13.33444. Since right after minute 60, it was draining at that rate, and right before minute 60, it was draining at that rate. So what's a good number that's in between these? It sure seems like negative 13 and one third liters per minute is our answer. And as it turns out, I can tell you, because I know calculus, that yes, it is. It is exactly negative 13 and a third. Now, in this case, you might notice that negative 13 and a third is exactly halfway between these numbers. That won't always happen when you're dealing with functions, okay? It happens because this is a quadratic, so don't worry too much about that. But that, that rule is, you know, it could be in some cases closer to the bigger value or closer to the small value. So just to kind of recap, because I know this is pretty, this is gonna be kind of heavy, a lot of a lot of theory here. We're basically <clears throat> looking at slopes of secants and using them to estimate the slope of a tangent. I mean, you can't use the slope formula to find the slope of a tangent because the run is zero. So if slope is rise over run, okay. If you're, sorry, if, if slope is rise over run and your run is equal to zero, well then you, it's undefined. In fact, when you do the slope of a tangent, your rise and your run are equal to zero. There's no rise or run because you only have one point. I'm gonna show you something in, in Desmos that models this scenario as well. Okay. So what we're looking at here is the graph of the hot tub again. And the blue line here is the real instantaneous rate of change. Well, sorry, it's the real tangent to at 60 minutes. So its slope is the actual rate of change of the hot tub water at that instant. What we did is we started by calculating the slope of the green line from 120 to 60, and you can see that sure enough, it is a much less of a slope than the blue line. And then what we did is we moved this point closer and closer to 60 minutes. And you can see the closer I get to 60 minutes, let me zoom in a bit even, that the slope of this secant starts to get closer and closer to the actual slope of the tangent line we're looking for. And no matter which direction you come at it to, it doesn't matter. So I think I just wrecked that there, that's okay. So I'm, I'm not sure how, how clear that is, but basically we're saying that we say that the slope of a tangent line is equal to the limiting slopes of the secants as the interval approaches zero. So what we were doing here, as we were calculating smaller and smaller secants, we were actually getting closer and closer and closer to the real slope of the tangent. So, although, you know, you can't, 
actually get to zero, okay, the interval that you're looking at, which is when I say interval, I mean like this interval here, 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 or negative 0 0.01, although that interval can never be zero because you'd have, you'd have zero over zero, it can certainly approach zero or get closer and closer. I can't draw a secant line that's exactly the tangent because the tangent doesn't have any run. Now, there is an algebraic definition of the slope of a tangent line at a point a comma f at a. So ours, our, our a value in the hot tub example was 60, and then our y value was v of 60. So instead of having f and a, we had v and 60. Okay, so keep in mind that what we're doing here is we are making this closer and closer to zero, and we're making this closer and closer to v of 60. Okay, in this example, it was all the way down to 60.01. If we wanted an even more accurate answer than this, we would make this 60.000001 and this 0 0.00001, okay? As close to we can is zero. So imagine, this is gonna be a bit tough, but here it is. So we say that the idea is to make this as close to zero as possible and this as close to zero as possible. Keeping in mind in our example, it was 60 you know, plus h, okay, minus v of 60. So that was what we actually did in the hot tub example. We tried to make these h values as small as we could. Well, that's the same as a limit. It's the limit as h approaches zero. It's a weird limit. It's, it's more complicated than anything you've, you've seen. And in any real case, you don't actually know how to evaluate that limit other than try putting small numbers in. Let's go back to our roller coaster example and let's do something similar. So remember the roller coaster was this funny looking graph here, height and time, and of course our instantaneous velocity or rate of descent is the slope of a tangent, the average is the slope of a secant. What I'm gonna do now is I've given you the equation I used to produce that graph here. It's not really important to understand how I came up with that. It's basically a combination of a sine function and a linear function, which gives you this sort of sine wave that sort of gradually decreases. And to keep it simple, I've actually called the height f and the time x, okay? And my first question is, can we use this equation to find the average rate of change from seven seconds to 10 seconds? So to do that, and here it is, we're basically calculating the slope of the secant from time equals seven to time equals 10. Okay, and you can see I've got all the math here. So in order to calculate the slope, my point here is, 7 and f of 7. And my other point is 10 and f of 10. And I'm not going to bother labeling that. And of course, they're three apart. So my rise is f of 10 minus f of 7, which is about 4.4362. You can see that there on the graph. Subtract 10.21, whatever, which is up here. Okay, and I get about negative 1.9274 meters per second. Average rate of descent from seven seconds to 10 seconds. But say that what I'm really interested in is the instantaneous rate of change or the instantaneous velocity at seven seconds. Well, that's the same as finding the slope of the tangent line, which might look something like that. No, oh, I'm drawing that very well. Let me try it again here, sorry. There, that's a little better. It looks something like that right there. And I believe that it sure seems like that's going to be a steeper slope than the uh, the secant. So we want to we want to figure out what this is. We want to estimate it. So what we do, just like in the other example, is we could start thinking about secant lines that are have a much shorter interval. In fact, we want the shortest secant line we can find, basically. So I'm going to pull that same definition up again. That the slope of the tangent is the limiting 
limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all divided by h. Now here, our a value in this case is 7 because we're basically saying, look, we have a point 7 and we want to get as close to that point as we can. Okay, so that our run is the smallest value we can come up with, the h that gets closer and closer to 0. And our y value here are, is as close to f of 7 as we can get. Okay, so we try some different examples to evaluate this limit. It's kind of like if you were, I'm kind of treating it like when we did n behavior, you know, and we figured out the limit is x approached positive infinity. And I said one way you could do that is just throw a giant number in. Okay, like 10,000 or a million or whatever. Well, now we're doing the same thing, but I'm just saying put a really small number in there. Okay, f of 7 is 10.21829. We already know that. And so we get this as our final formula we can kind of work with to estimate the slope of the smallest secant we can come up with. So one option is you could use h equals 0 0.1. So that means that here, here, you're essentially calculating f of 7.1. And if you do that, you'll get 9.98662. Okay, sure enough, a little lower than 10.21. And then your h value is 0 0.1. If you get, do that, you get negative 2.31669 meters per second. That's a very small secant line. It's probably a pretty good estimate, but of course you can always do better. We could do h equals 0 0.01. I think what would be a really great idea is if you pause the video and try to do that yourself right now and see what your better estimate would be. Okay, well, if you did that, then you should have gotten this right here. So again, this up here, this number here is f of 7.01. So basically subbing x equals 7.01 into the equation. And then your h value or your run is 0 0.01. That represents a very small secant line. It'd be hard to draw on the graph even. And you get a more accurate answer of negative 2.215. Why stop there? Why not try h equals 0 0.001? Okay, so this is now f of 7.001. We're getting really close to the, these two values being the same. That's why I need all these decimal places, because I can't round these and have these be the same or I've got a problem, okay, because the slope is not zero. So the decimals become so important because we're looking at a tiny, tiny, tiny little chunk of the graph to estimate the instantaneous rate of change. Kind of like David with his timer. And I get negative 2.20177. So just to summarize here, we started by getting an estimate of negative 2.31669 meters per second. We found that negative 2.215 was even better and negative 2.20177 was even better. So notice that, I mean, these are, there's a significant difference between these two numbers. How far do you keep going? Well, eventually, I mean, it's nice to do a few. You might just say, why don't you just start with h equals 0 0.001? Well, I just kind of want to see, like, what does decreasing h, what does it do? How much of a difference does it start to make? So big difference here, not so big here. So you might kind of think about stopping or, better yet, checking the other side. So in this case, it's like you're coming up with really small secants starting at 7 and a little bit past 7. Why not start before 7 and then end at 7? Kind of like when we decided David, who is measuring volume of the hot tub, could have started a stopwatch before 60 minutes as opposed to after 60 minutes. So I call that checking the other side, checking a negative H value. If we do that, we get negative 2.20638, which these numbers are very close. And our real answer's got to be somewhere between them. By the way, this means if H is negative, this value here now is now um, um, f of 6.999. Okay, that's what we're checking there. And again, very close to f of 7. So 2.2 you know, meters per second is a very close approximation. I said likely between, it is between these two values right here. Okay, almost certainly. Um, 
somewhere in there is fine, is is a really good answer. So it's always good to to check a, a couple small h values and then check an h value on the other side and know that your answer. Ha I mean, it has to be has to has to has to be between these two numbers right here. Now that tangent line that we've drawn, which is the black line I've drawn here, I've tried to draw it the best I can. It's a line, so it technically has an equation and we can find its equation. We found its slope, or at least we've estimated its slope. And so our estimate, we'll say it was negative 2.2. It also goes through the point 7, 10.218, okay? When you plug 7 into the equation, that's what you get. So using y equals mx plus b, we know m, the slope, is negative 2.2, and then we can substitute the point and to solve for b. Remember we're doing this back in grade 9. Okay, sub the point in. There's your y value and your x value. Okay, rearrange the equation so you can solve for B. Just bring this over to the other side. Your B is 25.618, and therefore the equation of the tangent line is approximately that right there. Now I don't, oh, sorry, that's wrong. I don't know why I've got that. 25.618. Um, you know, I'm not sure why you would want that equation. It's a very common question in a calculus class to find the equation of a tangent line, but I just thought I'd introduce that here and we'll do it again at the end as well. Okay, here's a few questions to think about. What does the sign of the slope of the tangent tell you about the behavior of a curve? So if you find that the slope of the tangent is greater than zero, then what does that mean? Well, that means that your tangent line has a positive slope, so it looks like that. That means that your curve or your graph is increasing, it's going up. That's all that means. In our, our two examples, we had negative tangents because something was going down, the volume of water in a hot tub or the, a person on a roller coaster. Um, if it's less than zero, then the curve is decreasing because your slope is going down. If the slope of the tangent is going down, then it must be that the curve is going down. Just think about a curve like the one we just looked at, okay? Wherever the tangent line has a negative slope, you're going down. And in places like this, where the tangent line has a positive slope, then you must be going up. What if the slope of the tangent is equal to zero? That means that it's neither decreasing or increasing. So one possibility is you might have a curve like this. And you might have a tangent right there that's equal to zero at the what's called a turning point. So that's a possibility. If the slope of the tangent is equal to zero, you might have a turning point. It's not always the case. It's possible to have it equal to zero even when you're not at a turning point, but that's probably it right there. So if you look at the roller coaster graph again, you'd expect a slope of a tangent to be zero right here and right here, okay, where you're changing direction. I'm not going to fill that in, but because it doesn't necessarily mean that, but it's usually the case. Just something for you to think about right now. Okay, last question from this lesson. Find the equation of the tangent of the curve f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 1 at the point where x is equal to 3. Okay, well, let's think about that for a minute. It's kind of, well, we should probably start by figuring out the point on the graph, which is... Um, Three, one. So just imagine you've got, like that's a parabola. There's your graph f of x. And somewhere on our graph, there's a point three, one. Maybe it's right there. And we're looking for the equation of the tangent line at that point. So something like that right there. So the question is really asking you for the equation of this black line. One thing we know about the black tangent line is it goes to the point 3, 1. We need the slope of that line, okay? Which is the same as saying what's the slope or the instantaneous rate of change of the curve when x is equal to 3. So again, we got to use this right here. we got to find a point really close to 3 and then calculate the rate of change between those two points. So I'm going to use, well, I can figure out f of 3 is 1, so I plug that in as well. 
If I use h equals 0 0.01, this is what I get. So again, using h equals 0 0.01, you're really calculating f of 3.01, subtracting that from 1, and then dividing by 0 0.01. F of 3.01 happens to be 1.0301. Not a big surprise, it's very close to 1. Because instead of plugging 3 into the equation, you're plugging in 3.01. You'd expect something pretty close. Divide by 0 0.01 and you get 3.01. Let's try the other side. Let's use h is equal to negative 0 0.01. In that case, you'd be calculating, so this calculation is F of 2.99 minus 1 all over negative 0 0.01. Okay, f of two, you plug 2.99 into this equation right here, and you're gonna get 0 0.9701, and that gives you 2.99. Well, so our real answer must be between, I mean, if we try to, the slope of a secant just past the point, so just past three, we got 3.01, and the secant just before three was 2.99, so, Seems like three is a pretty good answer, exactly halfway between. As it turns out, three is the exact answer. It is correct. If you take calculus next semester, you'll find it's actually just a very quick shortcut to figure that out. You're just not ready for that yet. So we can find the equation of the tangent line, y equals mx plus b. I, here I plugged in the slope, m is three, the y value, which is one, because the curve does go through the point three, one, doesn't go through the other points. Solve for b, I get negative 8. And so the equation of the tangent line is y equals 3x minus 8. Okay, that's it. I know I went fast through this video. Some of the calculations you might want to try yourself. Um, I've sort of skipped over that to focus on the big ideas. I know one question that students have is, you, how did you come up with these values? The, this one right here why those h values and you know how many h values should you try well there's no real answer you just kind of need to convince yourself that you're pretty you have a pretty good approximation i could have used h equals 0 0.001 okay i just didn't need to h equals 0 0.01 on both sides gave me a pretty good answer here so i don't i'm kind of leaving that there isn't really a, a steadfast rule you're basically tr you know you're trying to figure out what this limit looks like just by picking small values of h. And so whatever you do is probably okay. Um, now, if you're having some trouble with this, I've, I've got some other resources that I pointed you at, um, a video from the University of Waterloo that helps, and also the um, an example very similar to the hot tub examples done in your textbook as well. So feel free to ask any questions and Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully the last online lesson you have to do for a while.